Welcome to the third quarter 2024 Philips 66 earnings conference call. My name is Emily and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Jeff Dieter, Vice President, Investor Relations. Jeff, you may begin. Welcome to Philips 66 earnings conference call. Participants on today's call will include Mark Glazier, Chairman and CEO, Kevin Mitchell, CFO, Don Baldridge, Midstream and Chemicals, Rich Harbison, Refining, and Brian Mandel, Marketing and Commercial. Today's presentation can be found on the Investor Relations section of the Phillips 66 website, along with supplemental financial and operating information. Slide 2 contains our Safe Harbor Statement. We will be making forward-looking statements during today's call. Actual results may differ materially from today's comments. Factors that could cause actual results to differ are included here as well as in our SEC filings. With that, I'll turn the call over to Mark. Thanks, Jeff. Welcome, everyone, to our third quarter earnings call. The strength of our results in a challenging refining market demonstrates the benefits of our differentiated downstream portfolio. During the quarter, we continued to execute on our strategic priorities and delivered strong operating performance. Since July 2022, we have returned $12.5 billion to shareholders through share repurchases and dividends. We're approaching our $13 to $15 billion target. In refining, we've reduced our cost by a dollar per barrel, and we continue to run our system well. The improvement in clean product yield reflects our investments in high-return, low-capital projects. We continue to evaluate all of our assets as part of our strategic priorities and ongoing portfolio optimization. We recently agreed to sell our 49% interest in a Switzerland-based retail joint venture for approximately $1.24 billion. Our asset dispositions are now expected to exceed the $3 billion target. We plan to use the cash proceeds to support our strategic priorities, including returns to shareholders and debt reduction. During the quarter, we achieved the targets on two of the six priorities ahead of schedule. First, we have accomplished our $1.4 billion business transformation cost reduction target. We've driven a permanent shift in the way we work, and we remain diligent with a culture of continuous improvement. Our employees have done an incredible job delivering on this commitment, and the results are clear, as Kevin will cover later. Secondly, we achieved our $400 million synergy target across our NGL wellhead to market value chain. This brings the total uplift in mid-cycle adjusted EBITDA to $1.4 billion, from acquiring and successfully integrating DCP Midstream. Slide four shows the growth of our Midstream business. We've advanced our wellhead to market strategy through organic projects and strategic transactions that provided significant synergies and strong returns. Our Sweeney hub became the second largest NGO fractionation hub in the US with the completion of FRAC4 in 2022. The DCP transactions strengthened this competitive position by fully integrating our value chain. In the third quarter of 2024, we further expanded the business with the acquisition of Pinnacle Midstream. We also approved the construction of an adjacent processing plant with startup expected in mid-2025. On a trailing 12-month basis, Midstream's adjusted EBITDA has increased to $3.7 billion from $2.1 billion three years ago. In addition, Midstream adjusted EBITDA is ahead of 2024 guidance despite weaker natural gas and NGL prices. The stable cash generation from this business covers the company's dividend and our sustaining capital. We continue to high grade our portfolio and capitalize on our growth platform to generate strong returns and significant free cash flow. Before I wrap up my opening comments, I want to acknowledge our previously announced plans to cease operations at the Los Angeles refinery in the fourth quarter of 2025. The uncertainty of the long-term sustainability of the refinery and market dynamics were key factors in this decision. We are evaluating the future use of the property and will work with the state of California to continue to supply transportation fuels to meet customer demand. As we work towards decommissioning, we're grateful for our employees' continued focus on safety and operating excellence. We are committed to treating all of our employees and contractors fairly and respectfully throughout the process. We continue to deliver on our strategic priorities and targets. 
I look forward to providing an update on the next earnings call. Now, over to Kevin. Thank you, Mark. Slide 5 provides cost detail at the total company level through the end of the third quarter, compared with the same period of 2022. We have supported growth while mitigating inflationary impacts through business transformation and synergy capture. Through the first nine months of the year, we have realized approximately $700 million in cost reductions, including our share of WRB costs. In addition, we have reduced logistics spend by $200 million. These costs flow through gross margin. We lowered sustaining capital spend and continue to prioritize safe and reliable operations. Slide 6 shows the business transformation reduction to refining cost per barrel. Adjusted controllable costs, excluding turnarounds, are $5.84 per barrel year-to-date. We have eliminated $1 per barrel of costs, achieving our target ahead of schedule. Slide 7 covers key financial metrics. Earnings were $346 million. Adjusted earnings were $859 million, or $2.04 per share. The adjusted results exclude special items, which include a legal accrual in the third quarter. We generated operating cash flow of $1.1 billion and returned $1.3 billion to shareholders. I will now move to slide 8 to cover the segment results. Adjusted earnings decreased $125 million compared with the prior quarter. Midstream results decreased, mostly due to seasonal maintenance costs and lower equity earnings, reflecting the sale of our interest in the Rockies Express pipeline. These decreases were partially offset by higher margins on LPG exports. In chemicals, results increased, mainly due to higher polyethylene chain margins and lower costs. Lower refining results primarily reflect weaker crack spreads. Capture of the new indicator was 92%, in line with the previous quarter. In addition, the plan to cease operations at our Los Angeles refinery resulted in the acceleration of depreciation. The impact in the third quarter was $25 million. Going forward, we expect approximately $230 million per quarter of additional depreciation through the fourth quarter of 2025. Marking and specialties results were higher, mostly due to seasonally stronger margins. In renewable fuels, results decreased due to lower realized margins. The Rodeo Renewable Energy Complex produced 44,000 barrels per day of renewable fuels during the third quarter. Slide 9 shows the change in cash flow. Cash from operations, excluding working capital, was $1.5 billion, supported by the stability of our midstream and marketing and specialties businesses. Working capital was a use of $381 million, mainly reflecting the impact of falling commodity prices. In July, we acquired the nickel midstream for $567 million. Also during the quarter, we received cash proceeds of approximately $200 million from the sale of non-core midstream assets. Looking ahead to the fourth quarter, in chemicals, we expect the global O&P utilization rate to be in the mid-90s. In refining, we expect the worldwide crude utilization rate to be in the low to mid-90s and turnaround expense to be between $125 and $135 million. Full-year turnaround expense is now expected to be $485 to $495 million. This is a reduction of more than $100 million from our original guidance. We anticipate corporate and other costs to come in between $300 and $330 million. Now we will open the line for questions, after which Mark will wrap up the call. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. As we open the call for questions, as a courtesy to all participants, please limit yourself to one question and a follow-up. If you have a question, please press star, then 1 on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press star, then 2. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then 1 on your touchtone phone. Our first question comes from John Royal with JP Morgan. Please go ahead, your line is now open. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so my first question is just on uh, your decision to shutter uh, your remaining conventional capacity in California. Can you just uh, talk about uh, what went into that decision and 
Uh, how much did recent regulatory changes uh, play into that decision, or was this something that you had planned even after that? Yeah, good morning, John. Um, as we've stated in our strategic priorities, the, we, we will do an ongoing evaluation of all of our assets, and so the L.A. decision really was part of that. And uh, the Los Angeles uh, refinery has been under significant market pressure, and uh, the refinery, if you think back historically, it was originally designed to process in-state California crude production, and that's declined by about 75%. So the continued outlook in California in face of declining diesel and gasoline demand was was a pretty tough one. And so when we took that given outlook for the market and also factor in, you know, California's stated policy to move away from fossil fuels, uh, we expected California to be a pretty challenging refining market going forward. And we also have, you know, the typical uh, maintenance and regulatory spending that we face, and that's that's only going up. And so there are a lot of factors that go into these decisions, and uh, these decisions are only made after we do an exhaustive review of all the alternatives, and that exhaustive review led us to idle the refinery as we announced earlier this month. And, uh, and so it wasn't, it wasn't any kind of knee-jerk reaction in the face of any policy changes in California. This has been a long-term analysis. Great. Thank you, Mark. And then – um, my follow up on the balance sheet, and uh, maybe you could uh, just talk about your outlook uh, for the balance sheet and perhaps where you think you could uh, finish the year on leverage uh, following the sale of the Swiss business and, and potentially the Germany and Austria business, and, you know, recognizing there are a lot of moving pieces around working capital and some other things. But just any, any guidance on uh, where you could finish the year on the balance sheet? Yeah, John, it's Kevin. Um, so certainly expect to finish the year um, with a uh, stronger cash or net debt position than um, where we are currently, uh, and that will be partly reflected uh, by uh, proceeds from asset dispositions, but the, the bulk of that is going to be 2025. Um, so we expect the Swiss business, um, that transaction to close in the first quarter of next year, and the uh, the Germany, um, Austria retail business, we're still in active uh, negotiations around that, and so that will be a 2025 item as well. But then, nonetheless, the proceeds from dispositions give us um, a lot more added flexibility as we think about um, balance sheet priorities, continuing to um, return, uh, um, r return cash to shareholders, and also investment in the business. And just as a reminder from a capital allocation standpoint, the first priority is sustaining capital. That's about a billion dollars per year. The second priority is the dividend. That's approximately $2 billion per year. And everything after that is available for investing in the company and growth, um, returning cash to shareholders, of which the dividend obviously is a part of that, but um, uh, share repurchases, uh, and then uh, the balance sheet and debt reduction. So we're, we're a bit off of our target leverage uh, metric, and we expect to get closer to that. It'll, it'll take a little while when you look at the different components of the, the debt um, and the equity um, on that, uh, but we expect to be moving our way towards that uh, objective. Thank you. The next question comes from Roger Reed with Wells Fargo. Roger, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, Kevin, I Two questions for you here. I'll just throw them together. Uh, one is we think about the stated savings, the $1.4 billion on the synergies, the, or I'm sorry, on, on the uh, overall cost reduction plan, the $0.4 billion from the synergies with DCP, offset by the inflation that's in uh, slides five and six, I think, you know, which it sounds like you're using a standard CPI there. I just would like to maybe dig into a little bit of how do we look at those two moving parts? One, you know, pretty substantial savings. Two, inflation that's out there. You mentioned it comes out of the, the operating costs, but those can also be, you know, impacted by seasonality, by, you know, maintenance and so forth. But how we should really look at that on a net basis and, and what's the maybe inflationary pressure going forward? 
Yeah, I think um, as, you, as you look at that, and as you, as, you, as you point out, we highlighted the inflationary impact. We also highlight the market impact, and you could say those are two versions of similar factors. They're, they're market-driven. They're outside of our control. One of them is a, has been a headwind for the last couple of year, years. The other one has been a tailwind for us with uh, lower uh, natural gas prices primarily. And so what we're trying to focus on, as you would um, expect, are those things that are directly within our control, and that's reflected in that cost reduction bar on the on the chart. Um, I, on, on market, I wouldn't be completely dismissive of that being outside of our control because we are also, as part of our cost reduction um, initiatives, focused on energy reduction in terms of from a volume quantity standpoint. And so um, that is something that we're very um, focused on as well. It's also consistent with our um, uh, environmental uh, GHG objectives around that. But on a go-forward basis, I think the, the worst of the inflationary pressures are behind us. And um, we'd expect that that has somewhat normalized um, on a go-forward basis, so lesser headwinds than we have experienced over the last couple of years. And then just as a follow-up on that, the $100 million reduction in the uh, turnaround costs, is any of that related to the L.A. issue, you know, the shutdown, or is that just, you know, outperformance during the year? Hey, hey, Roger, this is Rich. Um, there's really two key factors in that $100 million reduction in our outlook. Um, half of it's attributed to this enhanced inspection process that we've been putting in place over the last several years. It's allowed us to actually extend the intervals between turnarounds. So some of that data was coming in this year on some planned turnarounds, and after we had a chance to evaluate it, we were able to defer those turnarounds. That's roughly half of that hundred million. And the other half of the hundred million is is uh the organization's execution of the work. They've actually we've actually gotten much more efficient at our execution through a number of initiatives that we put in place with the turnarounds and uh and, and we're seeing the fruits of that labor come through now. So great. Thank you. The next question comes from Neil Mesa with Goldman Sachs. Neil, please go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> good morning, team. Uh, just want to, to follow up on the comments around, uh, you know, balance sheet and capital allocation. And you guys have made a tremendous amount of progress in returning capital to short shareholders via buyback and dividends. But how do you think about the pace of that going forward and, and what appears to be a, a softer commodity environment? Yeah, Neil, it's, um, it, you know, I, I, for the last year and a half or, or longer, we have been very focused on the uh, commitment that we put out there, the 13 to $15 billion target, and that has um, somewhat informed our um, decisions around the pace of buybacks. Uh, as we get to the end of that, I think we, we will move to more of a, in excess of 50% of operating cash flow being the uh, so return to shareholder metric. We we talked about that, I think, um, on the last call, that uh, the go-forward assumption around this is 50% or more of cash flow operations being returned to shareholders. I think that's a good way to think about this as you model out into 2025 uh, from uh, for, for that metric. Okay, that, that's helpful. And then uh, we saw um, – uh, very solid strength in the uh, in the chemicals business relative to some of your peers uh, this quarter, and then marketing ticked up. I would imagine some of that's just because crude softened at the end of the quarter. But can you talk about those two businesses and the outlook as we think about the sequential uh, into uh, fourth quarter and early next year. Well, uh, Neil, I'll take the the chemicals side of that, and uh, yeah, we've seen. CP Chem's performance strong. They're they're able to operate uh, at high rates when others have had to cut back because of costs. I think that they they don't have uh, any operation or much operations exposure in Europe, which is beneficial. And they've got their advantage feedstock position, low cost ethane uh, in in two locations in the world that they've really been able to lean into. 
Uh, you do see some seasonal softness coming in uh, this time of year, which is pretty typical. And that, with lower crude prices, makes naphtha producers, the, the floor, uh, a little bit impacted there as well. But on the long term, we see, see continued improvement in the macro for, for chemicals. They, they're coming out of, of that trough of a, of a year or so ago, and they continue to make good progress. They continue to see demand from their perspective and their ability to capture the market increasing, uh, and we see that going forward. Hey, Neil, this is Brian. On, on the marketing side, Q3 is typically marketing's uh, strongest quarter. And uh, in, during the quarter, marketing had improved margins in the U.S. across both wholesale and franchise channels, driven, as you mentioned, by uh, falling spot prices. We also saw some stronger volumes. Uh, additionally, in the lubricants business, uh, base oil margins also improved with falling feedstock prices. But uh, going forward, uh, expectations for the M&S segment Q4 are just a seasonal pullback in earnings consistent with what uh, what we call mid-cycle Q4 earnings. Thank you both. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Neil. The next question comes from Ryan Todd with Piper Sandler. Ryan, your line is now open. <clears throat> Chris, thanks. Um, <clears throat> maybe I mean, one for me, I guess, on, on the refining side, you, you've made a lot of progress in terms of reducing cost structure, improving reliability and utilization rate, and even improving capture rate of your refining business. Um, but refining earnings are still struggling in the current environment. I mean, they're struggling for everybody. But as you um, – we're clearly below mid-cycle margins right now, but it still seems like you're a little ways from achieving your target for the refining business, even in a mid-cycle environment. I guess any any thoughts on where do you think you are in terms of progress there, and what still what should we still be looking for over the next twelve months um, in order to to drive that kind of the next leg of improvement and refining profitability? Yeah, Ryan, this is Mark. I, I'll just comment at a high level that I, I do believe that we're still on that journey. Uh, we've uh, pretty dramatically increased or enhanced our, our cost position. Uh, and we'll continue to do so. We are focused on uh, being competitive and continuing that journey. Uh, and we've also been very deliberate in just working away at these small projects that have quick payouts that en enhance our ability to capture the market. And we've got, in our strategic priorities, we've got things that we see in 25, things that we see happening by 26. And so we've got a long a long list of things that we can continue to work away at in refining to enhance our competitive position and increase our ability to capture value from the marketplace. Yeah, so maybe I'll just add a little little more color to that. Um, this is Rich. So we, we had three primary uh, improvement uh, focuses in refining. First, first is the cost reduction, and that's that's a that's a slog, right? It's it's getting in the mud pit digging it out and pulling out these expenses that are, are very sticky. It takes a lot of organizational effort to do that. I'm very happy with the organization's performance on this. And we've, you know, exceeded our expectations, original expectations, and now we've removed over $600 million of cost out of the cost profile for refining. So we're not declaring uh, infinite success with that. We will move to what I'll call a continuous improvement mode on, on the cost. But I will shift the organization's attention now to the earnings per barrel focus here as we move into the into the future. And, and that is taking advantage of what Mark was talking about, which are these small capital projects with high return. And uh, we'll continue to execute those. We still have a laundry list of those projects to go, but there's also efforts that uh, we utilize our existing equipment and making sure that we're extracting the highest level of value out of that. We see some opportunities across the system. We're going to focus on that and continue to extract that value out. And then, of course, uh, Brian's organization is working diligently. Uh, we, you know, this integrated model that we have uh, is really about extracting the value out of the entire value chain, and, and the commercial organization is the glue that keeps that together. And we've, we've got a lot of number of initiatives that we're working on on that front. You add all these up, they're well over a billion dollars of, of impact to our, to our earnings, uh, at, at mid-cycle pricing. So 
I'm very confident that when we get to mid, back to mid-cycle pricing scenarios, that you'll you'll see the performance of the refining organization hit hit the four, four to five billion dollar range of uh, earnings. Great, thank you. I, and then maybe um, one more as as we look at renewable diesel and we think about your um, the the path to improvement there. Can you maybe walk through how you think about the path to improvement in 2025, both in terms of the broader market, what are some of the levers or, or kind of moving pieces you think drive improvement in terms of the macro backdrop? And then maybe Rodeo specifically, what are, um, you know, what are things that you're looking to do that will, will drive improvement in terms of the profitability there? Sure. This is, this is Brian Ryan. Um, maybe to start kind of where we are today, we're, we're still in a startup mode for the renewable segment. Um, so I think we've had some startup costs. We're also running uh, higher or lower CI, but we're also running some higher CI now in uh, Q4. I think um, if you think about renewable diesel margins going into Q4 and beyond, we think margins are going to strengthen uh, for a number of reasons. Feedstock prices uh, remain depressed. Uh, there are a number of plants that continue to uh, struggle. Uh, some of the RD production is going to be converted into renewable jet production, like some of our competitors on the uh, Gulf Coast, and we will do as well. Uh, there are less imports into the U.S., uh, tighter West Coast carb diesel market with uh, refinery uh, production issues. We've even seen some renewable diesel from our competitors come from the Gulf Coast into the West Coast. And then just the stronger credit markets with the tightening of those of those credit markets and the disincentivizing of uh, biodiesel production. So all those things together, I think, will drive uh, renewable diesel margins stronger as we go forward. All right, thank you. The next question comes from Manav Gupta with UBS. Please go ahead, your line is uh, now open. Uh, morning, I wanted to focus a little bit on your central corridor earnings. You were up 65 million quarter over quarter or 26% quarter over quarter. That is something we haven't seen uh, in the Midcon region. Uh, it's a very strong result. Help us understand uh, what were the factors helping you out. And we understand you have very good assets over there, but generally talk us, you know, what, what really helped you out to deliver such a strong performance in Central Corridor. Hey, Manav, this is Rich. Uh, uh, thanks for pointing that out. We're very happy with the performance of the Central Corridor operation. Um, uh, there's a couple factors here that, that played into the, the outperform. Uh, one of them, mar margins were higher, which increased mainly due to a favorable impact on our inventory hedges. So with the WTI price falling quarter over quarter, that hedge was a positive uh, tailwind for us on that. We also had the benefits of the WCS uh, heavy crude diffs, which which are included in our indicator, but uh, that benefit was also uh, uh, seen in the in the midcon area as well. There was a 10% increase uh, quarter over quarter in the cracks for the region, so we did see that that positive uh, move there, and we did see lower product differentials though as a result of that as well. Our secondary products also played into this tailwind uh, for the quarter. We saw improved pricing in both the NGLs and the heavy intermediates. Um, and this is all, we all pulled this all together really uh, with very good operating performance for the region. We had 100% crude utilization and 89% clean product yields, which are two very, very good performances by the assets. Perfect. My, my quick follow-up here is, uh, you are at $2.7 billion on asset sale of the $3 billion, but you still have a marketing package out there in Europe. Uh, so how should we think about, you know, asset sale proceeds uh, for the next uh, 9 or 12 months? I, I think the way you should think about it, Manav, is we – it's part of that portfolio optimization. It's ongoing. Uh, we've defined what we think are our, our non-core – Assets and the, yeah, I would say that that three billion was considered as a a, a floor uh, that we would hit, and uh, we will continue to evaluate non-core assets and uh, 
and move forward with any dispositions that we view as favorable for us. Perfect. So three billion was the floor, not the target. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question comes from Matthew Blair with Judah Pickering Holt. Matthew, please go ahead. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, your refining capture held up pretty well in the third quarter at uh, at 92% versus 93% in Q2. Uh, typically in the fourth quarter, refiners see some tailwinds here um, just from things like lower or, or sorry, higher butane blending volumes. Um, could you talk about your expectations for, for capture in the fourth quarter? Do you think it's reasonable to expect a small improvement quarter per quarter or is it too early to say? I think it's too early to say, um, Matthew, just uh, one month into the quarter, there's, there's still opportunity for some, some volatility as we go through the end of the year. Sounds good. And then the West Coast seemed pretty challenging for Phillips and, and some of your peers in the third quarter. Um, I think the capture fell to 63%. Uh, versus strong levels in, in Q2. You obviously made the decision to close the Los Angeles refinery. Um, can you talk about the headwinds in the third quarter in the West Coast and whether there's been any improvement uh, so far in the fourth quarter? Yeah, Mr. Rich, uh, I'll talk about uh, some of the headwinds we saw on the West Coast. There's a lot of moving parts, actually. Um, so primarily we saw weaker market cracks, and weaker feedstock advantages. So those were both the keys to driving uh, lower earnings in that in that region. Margins decreased with our, our West Coast indicator, uh, falling about 46%. So you, you saw that if you if you're tracking along on our indicator. Those were primarily driven by Portland and Los Angeles gasoline cracks. Crude deliveries. Uh, also played into this as well. There was a, a prior month injection uh, of crude delivered by pipeline coming coming out of the uh, north from Canada, and uh, in a declining price environment, we also see we see an impact in that as well versus the benchmark. Secondary product impacts primarily related to heavy intermediate drawdown of inventory. In the second quarter, we built uh, heavy intermediate inventories uh, as a result of maintenance activity at both Los Angeles and Ferndale. And, and then the drawdown actually occurred in the third quarter, and that happened to occur in a declining uh, price environment as well, impacting the market capture. Uh, we are also experiencing some continuing costs associated with the wind down of the Rodeo crude operation. Uh, don't want to forget about that. We. We expect the majority of this work to be complete by year end as we prepare a number of the assets for demolition. The demolition costs are currently reserved in our ARO, but that cost to prepare for that demolition is uh, something that we'll see ongoing through the end of this year. And as Kevin indicated in his recap earlier, there was a, a couple entries into the quarter that impacted earnings as well from the LAR announcement to, to idle operations. One is the accelerated depreciation, that $25 million in the quarter. The other was a special item of $41 million, recognizing some benefit obligations associated with that announcement. That all said, you know, the assets actually operated well for the quarter. They had a 93% clean product yield and a 94% crude utilization for the assets. So primarily market-driven factors there. Great. Thanks for the color. Our next question comes from Jason Gableman with TD Cohen. Jason, your line is now open. Hey, thanks for taking my questions. <clears throat> I wanted to ask first on the refining business end, Back in the 2022 analyst day, there was some guidance for 5% margin capture improvement by 2025. Um, and I think there was some kind of um, optimization across the portfolio involved in that and some discrete projects involved in that. It sounds like maybe those those projects have been a bit delayed. I can't really tell. But, um, you know, how much has capture improved from 2022? Um, tough to compare given the change in indicator. Um, and would you say you're on track 
with uh, the projects that, that underpinned um, that capture improvement? Yeah, this is Rich again. Um, I, I, short story is we're on track, uh, and and the and how that's all coming together is is a series of small capital projects with high return. I mentioned those a little bit earlier, but in 2022 and, and 2023 we completed a series of projects, roughly 12 to 15 each year, and, and these are return projects uh, and assuming mid cycle pricing returned about 3% improvement in market capture associated with those projects. In 24, we have additional 15 projects that we're executing right now, and those projects will add about 2% of market capture to to a mid-cycle priced uh, earnings profile. So, uh, you know, add those all up to three years uh, program uh, on this, uh, it comes up to the 5%. That 5% number is equivalent to essentially $400 million of earnings at mid-cycle pricing. So uh, if you, if we see that environment, I, I'm very confident that we will, we will see that uh, impact and that actually hit into the market capture numbers that we're seeing through the existing indicator and we'll have to go back and recreate a bridge to the, to the traditional indicator. Okay, thanks. Uh, my follow-up question is going back to some of the commentary on distributions next year and the balance between deleveraging and buying back shares. Um, there's a few targets out there in terms of that there's 25 to 30 percent net debt to cap. There's 18 billion dollars of uh, net debt. Um, what's what's kind of the preferred metric investors should look at to uh, determine what the what the buyback capacity is um, next year? And and how do you feel about the balance sheet going into next year, given given all the concern around um, the refining market environment? Thanks. Yeah, Jason, it's Kevin. Let me make a couple of comments on that. Um, the, the the leverage target is the 25 to 30 percent level, but we acknowledge that that may take a while to get there, given the current environment and the absolute um, uh, not just debt level, but also you know it's it's debt and equity that uh, drive that calculation. We also are looking at absolute debt um, at a sub uh, sub 18 billion on a net uh, net debt basis. So we're at, at the end of the third quarter. We were at an 18 billion uh, net debt um, level, and we'd like to be a little bit uh, lower than that. Um, we do think that we're going to have a fair amount of flexibility going into next year because while the refining environment is weaker than we would like, uh, the other businesses are performing very well. We have the uh, broader portfolio, and you're seeing the benefits of that. And we also have some healthy uh, cash that will become available through the asset disposition. So while we've announced 2.7, um, less than half of that has actually been realized at this point in time. So um, we've got a fair amount still to come in, and there's other transactions that we're working on. So I think we'll still have a lot of flexibility to be able to meet our cash return objectives, and make progress on the balance sheet, which, as you know, is one of our uh, strategic priorities as well. Great. Thanks for that, caller. Our next question comes from Doug Leggett with Wolf Research. Doug, please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, Mark, I, I, I don't know if you want to take this one, but if we go back and look at the um, the targets you laid out uh, back in 2022, uh, the disposal program, I guess the acquisition of BCP wasn't in there either, but the disposal program was not um, explicit in your EBITDA targets. Can you give us some idea, I'm guessing it's a small number, but what the EBITDA loss is from the $2.7 billion of disposals so far? Yeah, no, thanks for, for mentioning that, Doug. Uh, you know, as we step back and look at our uh, earnings capacity at mid-cycle projection uh, at, at $14 billion by the end of 2025, 
Um, we also recognize that there's, a, there's parts that are moving in and out of the portfolio. And what, where we're landing is sometime early next year, we're going to look at the, the gives and takes, puts and takes around that number, and we'll come out with a, a revised uh, mid-cycle earnings capacity uh, and just and just recognizing that that number is uh, is not a projection of our, our of our earnings in 2025, but really our our mid cycle earnings capacity in 2025, and we'll we'll be updating everyone on that. You can put a number around the 2.7 billion at this point. Uh, we we're not prepared to do that right now. We'll we'll revise that early next year. Okay, thank you. And I guess my follow-up is actually related to that $14 billion. I want to make sure that uh, we don't misspeak about that being a target for 25. It's, it's obviously a, a mid-cycle capacity, as you pointed out. But embedded in there is a little over $5 billion of refining um, at mid-cycle. And you, you've obviously you've been in the press and quite vocal about your view of you know, what the capacity puts and takes are globally for the industry. And I'm just curious, when you think – Maybe we need to wait until next year. But if you think forward about what you had historically seen as mid-cycle, what some of us thought might be a better mid-cycle, that's obviously been kiboshed by, um, you know, by the last couple of quarters, obviously. But, but the, are you? I, I guess I'm curious whether you think there is still a case for a higher mid-cycle, or whether we're, um, you know, we're battling to hold on to what was the last 10 years as a mid-cycle average. Well, I, there's certainly a lot has changed in the last 10 years, and I think part of our review is we will have to step back and see, you know, what what has happened in in mid-cycle with respect to inflation inside the, the the crack spreads, where where all that comes down. I think it's it's very different than it was 10 years ago, but uh, but we do see uh, enhanced strength in our ability to capture value in our refining assets, and uh, and and we believe in. Uh, the long list of things that Rich has talked about and the combination of uh, creating more integration value, uh, our ability of our commercial group to capture more value from the marketplace and, uh, and a different posture around uh, how we trade around our assets has significantly enhanced our, our mid-cycle earnings capability in refining. And if you look at 2025, yeah, we don't believe that we'll be – at mid-cycle in 2025, but we also believe that going forward beyond 25 that uh, we're going to see global demand growth that will exceed the net impact of capacity additions and rationalizations. And you're seeing more rationalization announcements uh, coming at us and uh, very little uh, beyond the, the two big refineries that are coming on now, very little capacity addition beyond 2025, and so we've we've got a we've got a fairly bullish outlook in the medium term. Appreciate your comments, Mark. We'll look forward to that. To that update. Thanks so much. Thanks, Doug. The next question comes from Teresa Chen with Barclays. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my questions. Uh, first, on the cost side for the chem business, um, with ethane in Contango due to natural gas being into Contango, also perhaps um, because we have incremental residue capacity coming out of the Permian, allowing for the option to project um, into 2025, how do you see that impacting chem margins from a macro perspective through 2025? And related to that, you know, just given your processing footprint um, and your option to project or extract ethane, or at least some of your volumes, could that maybe a, a way to bolster earnings across the integrated value chain, midstream and chem, in a way that competitors cannot? Hi, Teresa. This is Don. Uh, I think, you know, from an ethane standpoint, as it relates to CP Chem, I think the uh, advantage of ethane will continue to be there uh, near term and long term. So I Feel feel good about that outlook and and how that will continue to be beneficial for CEP Kim's uh, position in in the chemical market. With regard to our assets and and how we think about it, um, we do have obviously with our gas processing assets, you know, a lot of flexibility in terms of ethane recovery and rejection, and we we make those decisions. Uh, on a day-by-day basis based on market conditions and what our downstream infrastructure is associated 
uh, with those assets and how to how to maximize both the throughput as well as the profitability as we uh, push those barrels downstream. So uh, we think we've got a you know as an integrated player a really good uh, uh, play kit to to utilize and, and op- optimize across that gas to ethane and then ethane as a feedstock into into the pet chem industry. So. Uh, we think it's going to be an opportunity set that we'll be able to execute on uh, here in the near term as well as uh, on down through the future. Got it. And uh, turning to the residue side in the Permian, um, I'd love to get a sense of, you know, how you view your exposure there. And you've sold a gas transmission asset outside of the Permian. Do you view your interest in GCX as core to your business, keeping in mind that the two other interests in GCX have, you know, consistently transacted with a double-digit multiple, and the pipe also recently FID an expansion that's going to cost nearly half a billion dollars on a 100% basis? Is that, you know, the best use of your capital? Um, love to hear your thoughts there. Well, first, I'd say, you know, we are very excited to see the customer support uh, behind the GCX expansion. We do think that's a big vote of confidence as to the, you know, the productivity and the outlook of uh, volume growth in the Permian, which obviously we're a beneficiary of given our footprint there. Um, and we are, uh, you know, an active participant in, in the residue gas marketing uh, space and, and moving gas uh, out of that basin. Um, so we're, we're pleased with, with where things situate from that standpoint. And then, I mean, I'd probably just reiterate what, what Mark had said. I mean, we regularly evaluate our portfolio and look for opportunities to high grade where it makes sense. Uh, we think that's just the right way to ensure our capital is allocated to the best opportunities. Um, so, you know, it, it, it'll just be part of, in terms of our GCX interest, it'll be no different than the other assets in our portfolio. We'll, you know, we'll continually evaluate and, and make a decision uh, when the time and, and the opportunities uh, make sense. Thank you. The next question comes from Paul Chang with Scotiabank. Paul, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, I think Sorry, the Paul. first question is uh, – good morning, Mark. Uh, the first question is for Kelvin. Um, I think in the past you have talked about a uh, four to five billion on the uh, cash balance. I don't know whether that is still the longer-term objective. And also I'm just curious that uh, given the volatility in the market uh, we are seeing, and your, uh, today you already saying that the debt level is a bit higher than what uh, you prefer in the longer term. Uh, should we still paying out more than 50% of the cash flow or that at least uh, we should say maybe the payout will be lesser for the, uh, after you finish the 13 to 15 billion of the commitment? Uh, so that's the first question. The second question is for Rich. Uh, you mentioned the Central Corridor. Uh, you benefit from the WTI hedges. Uh, I presume you are not referring to the CMI, uh, the CMA. Uh, you are actually physical uh, derivative that you you get into. Um, is that just you need for your Central Corridor operation, or that you're doing other kind of hedges uh, in the rest of your operation? Thank you. Yeah, Paul, it's Kevin. I'll, I'll hit your first question. I think the the four to five billion. That sounds like one of our competitors uses that number for cash. We've said two to three billion is our sort of ideal um, cash level, which gives us um, adequate flexibility. And of course, we've also got plenty of other liquidity available to us. So two to three is the number that uh, we've been saying in terms of um, cash balance. And as you can you can see, we were slightly lower than that. Um, at the end of the uh, third quarter. Uh, for, on a go-forward basis on cash returns, 50% still feels pretty reasonable as an objective, 50% or more. The dividend is $2 billion, and so that's, while in theory that's, there's flexibility on that, that's not how we think about it. That's a, we view that as a very much a commitment. Um, and the 50% still leaves 
adequate room for the other things we want to accomplish. I would also emphasize that we continue to be very disciplined around our um, capital program, um, our growth capital. So back two years ago, we said for the next couple of years, 22 and 23, we'd have a $2 billion capital budget. While we haven't laid out our capital budget for 2025 yet, um, we expect that we'll, you know, we're going to continue to um, have that discipline around how we make those decisions. So I think when you put all that together, the 50% is still a reasonable number. Hey, Paul, this is Brian. Just on the uh, on the accounting, for gap accounting, you have to mark your hedges, uh, and you don't mark the physical until it's uh, sold or moved. And so in a falling market, the hedges make money, and the physical doesn't get marked, so that will get marked in the following quarter. Yeah, but, uh, Brian, is it only for the Central Corridor that you have that, or that in other places, or uh, in other regions, you also have hedges? Yeah, we, we have it in all regions. So you yeah, have it in all regions. It's just much more significant. So the Correct. The volumes are higher. Yeah. 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 And there was a big move on WTI so, on this last, this last. So yes, only the WTI you hatches? Yes. We're, okay. We, we generally hedge with WTI okay. crude. Correct. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Jean Ann Salisbury with Bank of America. Please go ahead, your line is now open. Hi, um, I believe that the Enterprise TW Products Pipeline has started up to PAD4. Are you seeing that impact in PAD4 margins yet? Uh, no, we not yet. Okay. Um, and then my follow-up is, um, I, I think you kind of referenced this in the comments, but um, LPG export ARBs um, have gotten extremely wide, as I'm sure that you're aware, um, and I think they're expected to stay that way for a few quarters until more export capacity comes online. Um, how much exposure does PSX have to the ARB, um, and does that increase over the next few quarters? Yeah, this is Don. Thanks, Gene Ann. At, the, at Freeport, we are experiencing strong demand for L, uh, LPGs, and I would just say we have a portfolio mix of short and long-term contracts there at Freeport, as well as really across our whole NGL value chain. So, yeah, this portfolio approach, it lets us capitalize on opportunities like we see today across the system. It, it sort of helps uh, navigate where, you know, at any point in time across the NGL value chain, you have some positives, uh, you know, uh, uh, from a margin standpoint and some headwinds. So it really um, helps kind of level out across that value chain, but we are seeing, you know, real positive, uh, healthy uh, doc fees given the spread today to international markets, the ample supply of vessels, and then just a, you know, a, a tight uh, existing dock capacity across the Gulf Coast. So, um, we we uh, we'll, we'll we'll get a, a share of that, uh, and we we believe it's a pretty healthy outlook, um, as you mentioned, for the uh, for the foreseeable um, quarters. Great. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks for taking my question. Thank you. The next question comes from Joe Leach with Morgan Stanley. Joe, please go ahead. Hey, good morning, team, and thanks for taking my questions. So on the macro side, thanks for your comments earlier on the supply outlook. Uh, could you just talk to what you're seeing on the demand side for gasoline, diesel, and jet within your system, uh, as well as your outlook from here? Sure. Hey, this is Brian. Um, starting with gasoline, uh, global gasoline year to date, we're seeing about 1% higher than 23. Uh, European demand's a bright spot with uh, sales of gasoline-powered and gasoline hybrid vehicles supporting a higher growth in 3Q versus prior 3Q, about 4% up. U.S. demand performed well, too, growing over 1%. Uh, 3Q to uh, former 3Q, uh, part of that is the retail prices that were falling considerably with the uh, spot prices. On uh, distillate, year-to-date distillate, uh, global demand was uh, about 1.5% lower. Uh, in the U.S., we saw in 3Q about 2% lower than 3Q. Um, we're seeing some uh, cautiously optimistic comments from some of the freight companies. UPS, for instance, came out last week and reported positive revenue and profit growth in the third quarter. 
which followed nearly uh, two years of subpar performance. Also in the uh, global container business, the global container volumes are up. In fact, in August, uh, it hit a, they hit a, a record high, so seeing, seeing some positive signs there. Jet year-to-date global jet demand is about 8.5% higher than 23, driven largely by Asia. Uh, Europe and U.S. flight demand is back to, to uh, 2019 levels, but jet demand isn't quite back to uh, back to those levels, mostly because of the uh, aircraft uh, efficiency uh, and the fleet. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then just shifting to renewables, uh, some peers have talked about seeing a premium for, for SAF over RD. Uh, what are you seeing from a commercial uh, and demand standpoint for SAF at Redale? Yeah, we, uh, we we also see a premium for re- renewable jet production. I'll, I'll caution that in uh, Q4, we're likely not to produce renewable jet. We're, in, we're currently running off uh, higher C, uh, CI uh, uh, feedstocks for the plant as we prepare for the production tax credit uh, next year. But uh, we expect to be in steady state at uh, renewable uh, diesel, renewable uh, complex by Q1 of next year, and so by then you should see us producing uh, renewable jet. Great. Thank you all. Yeah, maybe just to add a little bit to that color there, um, we did actually produce sustainable aviation fuel in September, so we have um, in the past indicated that that was our intention. We did successfully produce the sustainable aviation fuel. There's this market anomaly that Brian's talking about here in the fourth quarter that will limit that production, but we, we will fully intend to be a supplier of sustainable aviation fuel to the marketplace. This concludes the question and answer session. I will now turn the call back over to Mark Leisure for closing comments. Thanks for all your questions. We delivered strong performance across our differentiated downstream portfolio. Business transformation achieved $1.4 billion of run rate cost reductions and lowered our refining costs by a dollar per barrel. Midstream achieved its synergy target and provides stable earnings with attractive growth opportunities. We expect to exceed our $3 billion asset disposition target, having signed agreements to generate $2.7 billion in proceeds to date. We continue to evaluate assets as part of our ongoing portfolio optimization. I'm proud of our employees' significant achievements toward our commitments. We're confident in our strategy and continued execution on the remaining targets. Thank you for your interest in Phillips 66. If you have questions after today's call, please call Jeff or Owen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. This concludes our call, and you may now disconnect your lines.